All right, well, it is one o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Indiana IEPRC's Summer Virtual Series. My name is Marcy Wilburn, and I'm the project coordinator for the center. We are so glad that you're able to join us today for Dr. Terrence Scott's session, Specific Teacher Behaviors to Facilitate Successful Student Behavior. Um, let's start with some logistics. So your microphones and your webcams are off. So no need to worry about muting yourself or disabling your webcam, that has been done for you. Um, I did send a handout um, prior to today's session. We had some problems when I sent it out first thing this morning and when I resent it, I forgot to attach it, but you all should have that now. So um, I received several reminders and emails about, hey, it wasn't attached, but um, you should have it now. If not, send me another email and I'll get it to you. I apologize about that. Um, throughout the session, we encourage you to post general comments within the chat. Um, the chat box is available in the bottom toolbar, along with the Q&A where you can post questions um, for Terry within the Q&A. Um, at the end of the session, you'll be prompted to complete a session evaluation. Um, as always, your feedback is important to us and we want to make sure that we're meeting your needs during this time, so please go ahead and complete that for us. Um, today's session is captioned. So to enable the captions, click on the closed captioning button in the lower toolbar. Um, certificates reflecting professional growth points will be sent to all participants within two weeks of the webinar. If you have any technical difficulties, please contact myself or Mark Suter. Currently our emails are on the screen. I will go ahead and add those to the chat boxes so that you'll have those throughout the presentation as well. And at this time, I will pass it over to Terry. Great, thanks Marcy. Um, and welcome everybody. Um, let's see if I can make my computer work here. Um, there we go. Um, I've titled this session, High Probability Practices for Student Success in the Classroom. Um, I'm going to talk about that topic related to all kids. But as always, I'm doing this kind of with a thought, at least in the back of my head, of kids with challenging behaviors. So I started my career as a counselor in a residential treatment facility. I worked with 100 and, or with 52 adjudicated adolescent boys. I then became an EBD teacher in a self-contained room. And I've worked with challenging kids my whole career. Now I like to talk a lot about things we can do across every kid in the school. And again, that's where I wanna go. But in the back of my mind, the reason we're doing a lot of this is because we know there are some kids that absolutely need these strategies. <clears throat> you all can probably think of a few kids that would be successful no matter what you do. And a lot of them that would be successful most of the time. But what could we do to maximize the probability of a maximum number of kids being successful a maximum amount of the time? So as we go through this, I'm going to keep talking to you about probabilities. In fact, I'm going to set you up on a wager as we go through the whole thing. So as we go through, oops, I'm sorry, let me go back one. I want to talk to you about some things that you probably are aware of, but maybe not to the, to the extent that I'm going to describe. We've been doing a ton of data collection over the past decade, looking at teachers and looking at students. And the purpose of that is to see if we can figure out what are the things that predict kids' success. But it also has allowed us to really look at some very predictable uh, relationships. And here are three things that we know from looking at 14,000 different teachers. One, if the kid we're looking at in that classroom, the kid we've targeted, happens to be a kid with an identified behavioral challenge, and I don't necessarily mean IEP, that kid will typically receive less instruction and more negative feedback from teachers, regardless of their behavior. Second, minority students, especially minority males, and if you really pull our data apart, it's African-American males, typically receive more negative feedback from teachers regardless of their behavior and regardless of the race of the teacher. And third, 
any kid who has disabilities is more likely to have negative interactions and more likely to be suspended. Why? That's the big question I think we want to start with is, why is this the case? Well, we don't know. Probably a lot of reasons. But here's the one that I want to go to that I think makes sense for us to consider. Again, I was a teacher of kids with behavior disorders, and I can remember the thought in my mind all the time was, don't let something get started. And if you've ever been a teacher of kids with emotional behavior disorders, you know prevention is your best friend. So it was always nip it in the bud. That's what I was always thinking. You gotta nip that problem in the bud. So what I'm doing is I'm staring at the room, staring at these kids and looking for where I think might be a problem so I can put the fire out before it starts. Well, what we know we as adults or humans have our implicit biases. You're not going to get rid of them. You need to be aware of them. We all have them. So what we find is that people will think in their mind, I think kids like this might be more likely to have a problem. And then they look at those kids more looking for problems. And this is just a big fact that we all need to address. If you think a kid might have a problem and you look at them for one, you will find one. Now, that doesn't mean the kids aren't having problems, but what it means is we can affect the number of problems we see from any particular group based upon the frequency with which we look at that group or the expectations we have for that group. So if I were to say, in my mind, for whatever ridiculous reason, I think anybody wearing a green shirt is going to have problems. So when the kids come in the room, I look for green shirts. And I stare at those kids with green shirts because I'm afraid something's going to happen and I'm going to need to nip it in the bud. Now, again, if I'm just going to stand and stare at a kid waiting for a problem, eventually they're going to do something. So on these points here, when I've said, regardless of their behavior, what that means is, even if these kids act exactly like the other kids, they're more likely to be seen as having the problem because we're looking at them. All of our problems are things we want to address, but let's be smart about it and let's think, where should we go first? So for instance, we know problem behaviors typically start in the classroom. This is data from um, 60 schools, and I think this was about, uh, it was 23,000 suspensions in a large district. So not 60 schools, this was a full district. So we analyzed those 23,000 suspensions and said, what's predictable? If you just look at location, better than 70% of all problems start in the classroom. So when we start talking about decreasing problem behaviors in the school, I think we should be thinking about the classroom first. So we know that they happen in other places, but the classroom is far more predictable. And there's a logic to that. Kids spend the majority of their time in the classroom. So that makes sense for the place where things would be most likely to happen. But if you look on the thing on the right there, the graph on the right, you cannot distinguish any of these locations by ethnicity. There's no way, there's no data. We have no evidence that anybody can go to a school and say, I can predict black kid problems, Hispanic kid problems, white kid problems, male problems, female problems, disability problems. We have no predictors for that. We have predictors for problems but the predictors don't predict kids by any particular characteristic just by looking at the predictor itself. The only thing that predicts kids is teacher behavior. And that's why I want to spend our time together today talking about teacher behavior. So here's another way to think about what might be going on in schools. This is data that we collected from a number of schools. And this is data that looks at what 
teachers do at different levels. I'm sorry, this one, this is just student behavior. There's another one coming with teacher behavior. Student behavior by ethnicity and level. So this is looking at 60 schools worth of kids. And we watched every single classroom in each of those 60 schools. On the far left there, you see student disruption. And that is broken out by white students and non-white students. You can see that across schools, the difference between disruptions for non-white and white isn't there. The, actually, it's double for non-white, but it's so low, we wouldn't really consider that to be a significant difference. The middle set there is off-task. Notice that off-task rates are also not different. Active engagement, a good behavior, not different. None of those are different at the elementary level. Now you can look at those again at the middle school level and at the high school level. And if they aren't absolutely identical, they're statistically indistinguishable. So there's no evidence that looking at kids, you can pick out who might have a problem when, where, doing what or why based upon anything that we would say is a looks like. Again, the only thing we have that predicts kid differences in behavior is teacher differences in behavior. So I would like to spend our time today, as I said a minute ago, talking about probability. I wanna talk about strategies that are highly likely to work. Make no mistake, there are a million or more things you could do and probably an equal number of articles or people telling you this one works? Well, those are empirical questions, meaning we can measure it and we can say which ones are most likely to work. But there is no strategy, no practice, no tactic, no thing you could do that's going to work for every kid or every time, even for some kids. Instead, what we've got are things that are more likely to work than others. So there's no sure thing, probability. So I want you to think as we're going through the day today, talking about all these different strategies, that what we're really talking about are probabilities. Some things are more likely to work than others. The things I'm going to show you are things that have been studied and we've got a probability for it. And because we've got a probability, we can say this one's X likely to work. If we know it's some X percent likely to work, that's great because now we can compare it to other ones. This one's got a 50% chance of working. That's not very good. This one's got a 70% chance. That's not great, but it's a lot better than 50. We always should be looking at every strategy and saying, is there something better? Is there something that would give us a better chance of making this kid successful? Because if we're not making them successful, we aren't doing anything that's going to help. So what's the probability of something giving us a success? And here's a good way to start thinking about that. We're going to go to the literature and look specifically at the type of literature and research that has compared probabilities for different strategies. So many of you may be familiar with John Hattie's book that shows up here, Visible Learning. It's the most recent and probably most comprehensive example of this type of research. What John Hattie does is he goes out and quite literally looks for every study that's ever been done on a given strategy. Maybe it's homework. Maybe it's positive reinforcement. Maybe it's time out. Maybe it's, and he's got everything you can think of in that book. Well, what happens when you find every single study that's ever been done 
is you can do a statistical analysis of, analysis of that and get something we call an effect size. I'm not going to go into effect size, but here's a good simple way to think about effect size. And effect size is what's the size of change that you typically see in kids for the positive by getting this? The size of change is a number. Now you could look at that number and compare it to the size of change you're likely to get for any other strategy. And obviously, the things that give you the most change are the things that are your best bet. If something is likely to give you a change of three and another thing is likely to give you a change of 10 and you want it to go up, then 10 makes more sense than three. You take the one that gives you your best chance. So what John Hattie does is he creates this little barometer that you see over on the side, and you're going to see some of those today because I like the visual of it. And he says, what we want are effect sizes that are bigger than what you get from the average nothing or the average doing what we typically do. So the average nothing extra. That would be 0.4. So what we're looking for are interventions, strategies, practices, things we can do that have a growth for kids that we would say was an effect size of more than 0.4. And then once you get above 0.4, we just want the biggest ones. Now, for those of you who really wanna dig deep into effect size, which I'm not gonna do, realize that number is standard deviation. So 0.4 just means 40% of a standard deviation, and one means a full standard deviation. That's how much we're looking at in terms of difference. So let's go back to even a simpler way of looking at this. I like this equation to really simplify all of that. A are the kids you know, kids in your room, kids in your school, kids you work with. They're unique. Their age, their size, their race, their abilities, their interests. And you want them to do C. That's your curriculum. So you've got your common core, all of that's in C. You've got your social skills, all of that's in C. And you've got your classroom expectations. Raise your hand to speak. Stay in your area, whatever all those things are. So what we want to know is what are the things that we, teachers in B could do to affect C. But I think that's the wrong way to ask the question. Hey, what could we do to make kids be successful? And the answer is almost everything has some success associated with it. Let's ask a different question. The question we want to ask is, what's the probability of C? So it's not what might make C happen. It's What's the best chance of C happening and being big? Now, that's a very different question. One of them was, what might work? And the other one is, what works best? Well, we know the answer to that question, and here it is. These are the things that we know from John Hattie and all the other research out there give you the biggest effect sizes. And so, in essence, I'm going to spend the rest of our time together talking about these things very quickly. Explicit curriculum. Tell them and show them what's important and tell them why we're doing it. Model and demonstrate. Do that while engaging kids. They should be thinking and doing and talking and, do and building, not just passively sitting and listening. Set goals for how much you want kids to do and work toward a goal. One, we know that when kids get feedback toward a goal, the achievement is higher. Same for adults, by the way. Be consistent with how you do things. Don't just talk about it, teach it, and then set kids free. In between, you doing it and them doing it should be guidance, what we used to call scaffolding, guided practice before independent practice. Move around. Be near the kids. Engage with the kids interact with the kids, talk to the kids. Don't make them do tons of practice all at once. Space it out. 
If you believe it's going to take 100 repetitions before they'll be able to fluently do this on their own, then we want them to do five a day for 20 days rather than 20 a day for five days. We want small numbers of authentic practice spaced out over time with high rates of success. Making them do a thousand of them all at once will not give you a good effect. Plus, you're likely to get kids hating it because it's boring. Assess as you go, not only at the end. And our bottom line here is, if you're not getting kids that are successful more than they fail, then all of those other things aren't being done well enough. You're going to have to be more explicit. You're going to have to model more. You're going to have to be more engaging, etc. When it doesn't work, we don't have anything other than these things. We just have to do them with more intensity. And there's the logic from PBIS or RTI, MTSS, whatever you want to call it is, let's use these things really well at tier one. Let's find kids that need them to be tweaked and do a little tweaking at tier two. And at tier three, we're going to really intensify these things. But these are the things because these are the things we know give us our best chance of success. So how much more positive than negative from the kids? We don't know. But here's a really good rule of thumb, 80%. If kids are successful with what you're asking them to do 80% of their trials or better, we've got a pretty good set of evidence out there that they'll keep doing it without you. And that 80% is a ratio of four to one. So let's think about trying to get it set up so that kids are being successful at least four times more often then they're not. So what if, we'll make this real for you. What if I were to say, I have access to all of your money. I have your retirement accounts. I've got your checking account, your savings. I've got everything you own. I control all your money and I'm going to wager it. And so it's a double or nothing. You either double all your money, every penny you have, or you lose it all. Here's the bet. I've got a doorway over here leading to a classroom filled with middle school kids. You don't know these kids, but you're all familiar with middle school kids. <laughs> I also have a brand new teacher here. I'm going to take that brand new teacher, just got degree, just got certified, and I'm going to stick that teacher in that room and lock the door for one full week. We're going to watch on video. If that teacher is successful for the week, you've doubled your money. If not, you've lost it all. Here are the specific criteria. Those kids have to be on task 80% of the time. No kids can be removed from the room. If the kids as a whole aren't on task 80% of the time, you've lost your money. If any individual kid needs to be removed from that classroom, you've lost your money. So we're not watching football here. You can pretend like you're in the sports book. We're watching a classroom, a middle school classroom. Remember, both of those conditions have to be met or you've lost everything. If you knew this in advance, is there something quick you could tell this teacher that would ensure their success and you're winning your money? So you've got five minutes to talk to this teacher. What would you tell him or her? What are the things that are most important? And as a teacher myself, when I think about this, I think, well, there's so much. In five minutes, all I'm going to do is hit the big things, and I don't think it's ever going to be enough. When I ask teachers this, a lot of times, these are the most typical things I'd hear. Be patient. 
yeah, that's an important thing, but I don't think being patient alone is going to make this work. Love the kids. I want you to love the kids. I want you to like the kids, etc. And I hope you do, but that alone is not going to make you win this bet. So all of these things are important, but what should you be doing? What should you be doing on a daily basis? That's where we really need to talk if we're going to make this work. So what I'd like to start with is teaching. Now, what we could say is, because a lot of people said this to me when I was in my first years of teaching, you need to not worry about teaching going in. You need to worry about behavior management. You need to get all the class under control and all the behaviors under control, then you can teach. Well, that kind of makes sense. But my problem is, if all I'm doing is managing behavior and not teaching, how do they know what those behaviors are? Because those behaviors need to be taught. So let's spend some time teaching behavior start of the year. But what does teaching mean? What are the things that need to be involved in teaching in order for it to be effective? I really believe this. If all you do is teach and not worry about the environment, it's not going to work very well. And if all you do is worry about the environment and don't teach, it's not going to work very well. You have to do both. They happen simultaneously. One helps the other. So we don't go in and first do classroom management, then do teaching, nor do we do teaching, then classroom management. We do both right from the beginning. So let's start with our logic for teaching. Here's kind of a complicated looking slide, but I want to explain it very simply. This is a schematic that somebody else has come up with that looks at how people learn. So look at your long-term memory there, which is part of your brain. That's where you keep all the things you need to know in order to be successful. So every time you learn something, you commit it to your long-term memory. Then when you need it again, your working memory goes up and finds it. How quickly can you find it? It depends on how well it was stored, how organized it was. So you have little folders in your, in your brain. You have a folder called flat tire. And if you come upon a flat tire in your life, you can go up to that folder and find your memories of what to do. How to use the jack, how to change the tire. Maybe it's just how to call AAA, but you've got a folder and when you've got a flat tire, you know how to access all the examples. But, that's because those things were taught in context. You learned about flat tire in the context of flat tire. It wasn't a random rule someone threw out at you once. It wasn't like you're walking down the street one time and someone stopped you and just said, let me give you a hint about flat tires, which would have meant nothing and gone nowhere. You had got it in context. So let's transfer that logic to learning. Let's say, this is, sounds like a lot like a computer. Let's say that long-term memory is like the hard drive on your computer. It stores all the information. That working memory is like the processor. When you need something, you go and find it. The processor says, we need this information. It goes and gets it. But what if, what if the information in your long-term memory on your hard drive was random? Think about it like this. What if I told you, you are no longer allowed to use any folders on your computer? From now on, every document and every program must be sitting on your desktop. No folders allowed. I know many of you now have 20,000 documents sitting on your desktop. So even though you've got all the examples you need to solve a problem, if I said, go find those examples, you wouldn't know where to find them. And if you don't know where to find them, you resort to automatic habitual behaviors like yelling and throwing things and hitting people and those kinds of things that kids do. So what we know is 
when we don't teach in an organized contextual way, when, when teaching is random, when you've taught it in a random way, kids can't find it and they'll lose it in 30 seconds. And then we keep saying things like, we just talked about this yesterday, walk in the hall. But if that was not given in a context, here's what walking in the hall means. Here's where we do it and why we do it. Here's how we do it. This is the reason for that. If it wasn't given in context, if it was just shut up and listen, here's a rule, walk in the hall, then it isn't gonna stick. And what we end up with is poor instruction. So here are some examples of poor instruction and good instruction. On the left, those classroom rules, don't hit, don't kick, don't push, are about as logical as the sign below it. They're not likely to make it happen. No crime, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Putting up a sign that says that ain't gonna make it happen. And just like that sign, everybody knows we're not supposed to hit. Everybody knows that. So what's the point of that sign? It doesn't tell you what to do, when to do it, or why to do it. It's not contextual. It's not explicit. It doesn't give you information. But look at the two on the right. Both of those are, contain a small list of what to do. Each of the things on those lists can be taught. Watch me. Here's why we would do it here. What if this happened? How would we use it? Let's see an example. Why do you think I did it this way? That's teaching. It's engaging kids with the back and forth. It's being explicit and it's giving examples that are authentic. That's what we want it to look like. And that's why when we talk about teaching rules, tie it back to what we do with PBIS. In PBIS, we always say you've got three to five big ideas, like respect others, respect yourself, et cetera. Teach what those things mean, and those become what we call anchors. You need three to five anchors to which all your expectations are tied. We don't have a rule, walk in the hall. We have a rule, we walk in the hall to respect others. We walk in the hall to stay safe. Why do we stay safe? That's one of the big ideas we have in this school. So what you do when you tie rules to big ideas, to anchor them, is you build a context in the kids' brains that make these more easy for them to be retrieved. So when we talk about be explicit, teach what to do, when to do, why to do, along with how to do, and tie them to those bigger ideas, what we're doing is we're trying to make these more likely to be retrievable. Or it's good instruction. This is the way we teach reading and math and all those other things in academics. We don't teach, hey, it's algebra. Here are 50 things never to do. And we don't just teach random principles. We've thought about a scope and sequence and we've taught it so that it's contextualized and we're building on something. Same logic for teaching the rules for your classroom. In essence, high probability instruction involves three things. We've just talked about number one, be explicit. Set them up to understand what it is, why it is, how to do it. A lot of this is, what would this look like in your neighborhood, in our classroom, on the playground? How would this make you be more successful when you're doing X, Y, or Z? So being explicit is explaining it, but it's also contextualizing it, making it fit so they know where it's coming from and why. Second, that doesn't work that being explicit part, if the kids aren't listening, if they don't care, it's our job to engage them. We want to maximize the amount of time they're doing things with us, listening to us and responding to us and doing things. Now it's okay to have times where they listen, but that needs to be broken up so that they're not 
doing nothing but sitting and listening because it's boring. And it's boring to listen to me do this. It's really hard to engage you in a meaningful way when I can't be there to look at you and talk to you. But that is something I have to think about. So what I'm trying to do are give you um, activities where I say, what if, what if it was a bet? What would you, I want you to be thinking about things. But if I were talking to a group of middle schoolers right now, I'm not sure that would be enough to keep them with me. Number three, kids need to have lots of chances to respond and get feedback from teachers that is more positive than negative. How much more positive than negative? Well, four to one would be what we want as a minimum. <clears throat> so let's break this apart. What do we know about those things? And I want to keep taking you back to hard evidence. What we do when we do those three things is we do something that's kind of liberally called direct instruction. The effect size for direct instruction is 0.59. So what? Is that good? Any effect size is only good or bad compared to others. So the better question then is 5-9 good is, is there any kind of instructional methodology that's better? And the answer is, if you read John Hattie's book or look at the other sources on such, no. In fact, nothing else even comes close. Many of the instructional methodologies that are very popular actually have effect sizes close to zero. What we want to do is say, when we're teaching, what's our best chance? Doing these three things is the best chance we've got. Now, I don't know that I necessarily would call those three things strictly direct instruction. And I don't care if we do. Make up a name for it. But it's those three things. John Hattie refers to it as direct instruction. So here's what we did. Again, we went out and we watched teachers. We sat in the back of the room and we watched what they did. And we did this thousands of times, literally over 10,000 times. Three of the things we looked at focus on the students or the teachers actively teaching, talking to kids, showing them examples, etc. So it's kind of like being explicit. Opportunities to respond. How often did they give the kids chances to answer questions verbally, tell a neighbor, show an example, build something, etc., something physical? Three, how often did the teacher say or in some physical way affirm to the student that they had done something right? Yes, thanks, good, thumbs up, anything. So what we did was we then went through all of the teachers we'd coded and looked just at those three things. And we did something called a latent class analysis, which is basically just looking for clusters. How many kind of unique types of teacher are there? And what our analysis showed was there are three types of teacher which you can think of in terms of those three things as doing those things at high, medium, or low rates. Now we can use that to predict what kids will do. So let's take a look at teachers who use those at high, medium, and low rates and see what that predicts for kids. Here's what we found. If I walk in and watch a teacher in a classroom for 10 minutes, if the teacher that I'm watching uses those three things in the lower third of all teachers, right now stop and predict that that classroom will have kids that are 27% more likely to be off task and a whopping 67% more likely to be disruptive. What we know is nothing in our world is a better predictor of kid behavior than teacher behavior during instruction. Knowing that a kid is poor isn't as good a predictor of that. Knowing that a kid is, and put in your descriptor here, we don't have any descriptors that are better predictors of kid behavior than teacher behavior which is why we continue to focus like this. So let's go just to engagement. What we want is we want the teacher to provide opportunities for kids to respond during instruction. We call those opportunities to respond OTRs for short. 
OTRs are associated with higher active student engagement and increased achievement. We've also got evidence that when teacher OTRs are above three per minute, we start seeing statistically lower rates of student disruption. So we've looked a lot at OTRs. An OTR is anything the teacher does that requires the student, or as we say, gives the student an opportunity to respond in any way, verbally. You can raise your hand. Raise your hand if you agree. Hold up your hand. Two fingers if you think it's right. One finger if you think it's wrong. Create one of those. Share it with a neighbor. Talk to a neighbor. Demonstrate that. Draw it. Hold it up. Anything you do that gives the student an opportunity to respond within the curriculum is an OTR. And remember, we get good outcomes for kids when teacher OTRs are at about three per minute. So going back to coding again, I'm gonna dig a little deeper. What we know after watching teachers and coding what they do. When we do this, we only watch for 15 minutes and we only watch instructional time. If the teacher says, that's it, the lesson's over, go practice, we stop. We don't start until the teacher starts. We don't code during roll or other setup. We have done this again thousands of times, and we did publish a book a few years ago on what does the average classroom look like. And so I'm going to show you some of that evidence. This is another thing we published looking specifically at OTRs. So one of the things we look we end up with is looking at a lot of low-income schools. And that's because we get grants and the grants want us to work with low-income schools. And so we do a lot of coding. And what we find are really low rates of teacher behavior. So I started wondering, what's the difference between low-performing and high-performing elementary schools? So we did a little search and we found out that in the state of Kentucky, there were 11 schools that were high in high in um, Title I, so low income, but high scores in reading. Title I plus distinguished in reading. So we went to each of those 11 schools and we watched every teacher and we coded them. We then matched a sample of 11 similar Title I schools with very low reading scores. And we watched every teacher in those schools. This analysis is something called a hierarchical linear modeling. What it tells us is, where does that variance come from? What accounts for it? Here's what we found. The only significant variable here was the degree to which teachers gave OTRs to the group, meaning the whole classroom. Hey, classroom, raise your hand if you agree, as opposed to doing it to just one student at a time. So what we've got is, when teachers use more OTRs, the kids are more engaged. And when kids are more engaged, academic scores go up. So what we found is that in schools where teachers used more OTRs, even though they were poverty schools, we were getting much higher academic outcomes. But here's our absolute OTR rates on average. And so these are what we call clean data, data that have no oddities in them. They went the full 15 minutes, et cetera. So here's 6,730 elementary classrooms, different ones. The average OTRs per minute in elementary is 0.82. We'd like to see three. So look at how low we really are if we want three. At middle school, 0.6. At high school, 0.5. At best, we're less than a third of where we should be if we're really wanting to maximize probabilities for success. Engaging students is incredibly important, and it is something that we aren't doing well. But what I'm finding is it's also something that our teachers don't even know about. And I think a big blame for that is at higher ed. If we aren't teaching people why this is important, if we aren't being explicit with what OTRs are and why we should do them, 
why would we expect that people would use them? We have to get back to thinking about engagement as our big deal. How do we find ways to engage kids so that they are wanting to be there and listen to us, et cetera? So let's jump from there to the feedback part. At the feedback level, all we're looking for is, hey, I saw you do that. That's it. When I say feedback and when I say positive reinforcement, I believe that many teachers think that I'm saying you need to hand something out. You need to give away some goodies, at least some sort of tokens, but that's not what I'm talking about. When we say feedback rate, we mean simply letting kids know they did it right. And you can do that in a number of ways. And the best way to do that is tell them. Verbal praise. Hey, I saw you do that right. Good for you. That's what we're looking for. Now, clearly, there are some kids that will need bigger than that. But we don't know who needs bigger than that when nobody's doing bigger than that. So when we talk about verbal praise, be age appropriate with it. Now, you can do it sarcastically, and it's not going to work as well. Think about what would sound right for the kid you're talking about. Be specific. Wow, you got that answer right. Wow, I'm impressed with how you did that. Hey, I noticed that you walked today. Those are all telling you you did it right. Notice none of those are saying anything about me. I approve. It's, wow, I noticed you. You did it. That's what we want kids to hear. Hey, you did that. You did it right. And mix up your superlatives. Find different words besides just good, good, good. Exactly, super, wow, I'm amazed, awesome, perfect. Make kids think you really did notice them and you're really talking about them specifically. So when we talk about feedback, notice that our effect size here is 0.73. Is that good? Well, it's only good or bad relative to what else we got. We don't have anything else in that realm. So kid did something right, what should we do? When a kid does something right, you saying to them, hey, you did that right, is a giant effect. There's nothing close to this. 0.73, three quarters of a standard deviation for doing nothing more than saying, I saw you do that right. That's it. That's where we want to be with this. So again, I want to hit on this. When we say feedback, all we mean is telling kids you saw them do it right, acknowledging it in some way. We can do it bigger, but let's not if we don't need to. And when we talk to people about effective instruction and they think, oh, they're telling me I need to buy M&Ms or something, remind them, effective instruction just has a lot of verbal feedback in it. It doesn't mean we're buying anything, and in fact, we shouldn't be. But feedback, what do we do when they do it right? And while I don't want to talk about what we're doing when they do it wrong, I do think I need to say this. We have zero evidence in our world that removing a student from the classroom or the school results in a decrease in problem behavior. What we do know is removal is more likely to be used with minorities and students with disabilities. And removal doesn't change behavior. Remember, we're removing them supposedly because it's a punishment. But if you remove them, and what we know is the best predictor we can make from a kid who was removed from the classroom or the school is that they'll be removed again. So if the best predictor you've got from using that is that you'll have to use it again, it means it's not working. Punishments make behaviors go down. Removing kids tends to make behaviors go up. I'm not suggesting no kid should ever be removed from the room because clearly there are times when that needs to happen. But I am suggesting that if you're removing kids to teach them a lesson, it isn't going to work or it's unlikely to work. 
what does feedback look like out there? Let's go back to those same classrooms we've looked at before. At the elementary school, positives happen 0.16 times per minute, negatives 0 0.05 times per minute, which is a ratio of three to one. Now, the last one on there, the 0 0.004 is correction. Here's the difference between negative feedback and correction. Negative feedback, nope, that's not right. Corrective feedback, does that look right to you? What would be a better way? How could you make that right? It involves engagement and reteaching. We don't see corrective feedback hardly ever. In fact, we calculate it out. When we go to a school, we look at every teacher. We see one corrective feedback from a teacher every 13 schools we go to. Even though we know it's far more effective than just negative feedback, it isn't something people use. Middle school, that ratio has dropped to 1.9 to 1. Again, we'd like to see at least four. Four to one is gonna work for the average kid. There'll be some kids that need even more than that. 1.9 to one, now we're not working possibly even for the average kid. And look at this, 1,983 different high school classrooms we looked at. In the average high school classroom, a kid is as likely to hear positive and negative at the same rates. That's a problem. Because what that means is for the average kid, we aren't setting them up to be successful and letting them know at a rate that's high enough to predict future success. That's problematic. Anytime you can say, here's what I'm doing, and it doesn't predict success, then I think a logical question is, then why are we doing that? The purpose of us teaching is to predict that future success. So I got a couple other things I want to show you before we move on to the second big chunk, which is learning environments. First, this is a large analysis that is currently under review. Um, actually, this is not currently under review. This was accepted for publication. Um, what this says is, let's just look at OTR and positive feedback in a large school district. So we went to a large school district. We looked at a ton of schools. And what we found was, if all you look at is positive feedback and group OTR, those two things individually are significant predictors of low suspension rates. Meaning in schools where the positive feedback is higher, they are less likely to have suspensions. In schools where group OTRs are higher, they are less likely to have suspensions. Put them together and cluster them. And what you find is that in schools that use higher rates of both positive feedback and group OTR, we see a statistically higher percentage of students that are proficient and distinguished in reading and math. What the teacher does during instruction predicts behavior and predicts academics too. One last thing before we jump into that second piece. I want you to think about the way adults engage with students. This is common area. So we stood in common areas like hallways, cafeterias, entryways, locker areas, playground, and we watched teachers. The red bar is what percent of the time that we're watching that adult were they watching kids? And so those are pretty good, well over 90%. The green bar is what percent of that time did they talk to kids? And that's not as good. So here I am standing in a hallway, a cafeteria, et cetera, staring at kids. That's good, I'm looking at kids. What could I do to maximize the probability of kids' success once they leave me in that area? And that would be engage them in some way, provide feedback in some way. But at elementary, it's only 17 drops to 11. And by high school, 2%. Only 2% of the time when we're hanging out around kids, do we say anything or engage them in any way? 
And that's to me just an opportunity lost. A, a chance we could have to do something to make kids more successful, and we're just not using it all. And that to me is a teaching issue. You could call it a relationship issue, and it is, but it's also a lost opportunity for instruction. Well, it's when they do talk to kids, which is rare, do they say something negative or positive? And what we find is that it's overwhelmingly negative. And those ratios are crazy. So at high school, for instance, every 4.3 minutes in high school, I might hear something positive. But I hear something negative as the average kid every 23 seconds. So when you get to the classroom after being in the hallway and the cafeteria and whatnot at high school, what kind of mood are you in if that's the way it's been? Now, I know some people have looked at this and said to me, well, that's because those kids never do anything right. I have two responses to that. First one is, that's not true. I don't care what school it is, the worst school I've ever been in, most of the kids at any point in time are doing what you've asked. Second, if it was true that no kid is doing what you've asked, then you've got way bigger problems. So if you're thinking, I don't want to try to give more positives because none of our kids are doing something right, I think you've got an even bigger chore ahead of you. But again, I don't think that's really the case. So let's go on to our second big chunk. Our second big chunk is effective learning environments or classroom management, you could call it, for lack of a better way to say it. But how do we control an environment? Everything we do in our classroom controls the environment. For instance, schedules. We control the schedule. We control what we do in our classroom. To the extent that we are consistent, we increase the probability of kids' success. So what we want to do is establish routines where kids can predict what's going to happen next. Sometimes you need to make that formal. So I showed here a schedule. I personally always put the schedule on the board where I worked. Now, I did work with kids that had pretty extreme behavior problems, and they needed that level. But it doesn't hurt anybody to have this kind of structure. So think about it as prevention. But if I put this up there, what I do is I let kids know what's coming and how long it's going to last. I give them some control. It's really, as a human, it's really painful to feel like you don't have control. And I liken this to going to a meeting without an agenda. When I go to a meeting and there's no agenda, it's just people talking. And I keep thinking, if you'd shut up, we could go home. When we have an agenda, I have some control. I feel like I can say, but aren't we supposed to be talking about this? And I love checking those things off. I don't know why I derive such pleasure from checking things off of that agenda. But I think of that when I think of a schedule. I want the kids to know what's coming next, how long it's going to be, and what we're doing. So they don't have to worry about it. I don't want them asking me forever, do we have to do that today? How long is it going to be? Can we not do that? I want to just say, well, it's 940. That means it's math time, just like every day. But we only go to 1030, and we're only doing page 19. It's comforting if you have a schedule and you stick to it. For everything on that schedule, you should have expectations. So there should never be a time that you could look at that schedule and have kids say, I don't know what we do here. They know what we do when we wash hands. They know what we do when we walk to lunch because it's been taught. That schedule represents some expectations. It's an organizer for all of those expectations. Think about putting those activities in an order that makes sense. Have your quiet time after an active time so kids have already gotten the jitters out. But also, think about length. How long can your kids do something before it won't work anymore? Build your schedule so that we don't go past that time. 
How long will your kids read independently before it starts to break down? 20 minutes? Then don't schedule 30 minutes of independent reading time because it's a setup. If you say, I have to get 30 minutes, then do 15, take a break, do 15. But you can't logically say, I know they can only go 20, I'm asking for 30, because again, what you're saying is, I know kids will fail. And we don't ever want to do anything in a school that we know will set kids up for failure. They get enough failures. Our logic has to be, what could I do to make it more likely they'd be successful? Which means, if you're going to be consistent, you need to explain ahead of time whenever it's going to be different than normal. Hey, it's assembly day. The schedule's different. My kids would freak out on assembly day, and I'd have to say it a thousand times. But that once in a while that I had to do that was worth it for the calm that I got the other days. The other thing that I would do as a last thing to say here is as the year goes by, I try to loosen this up just a little. But as I loosen it up, I tell kids I'm loosening it up. In other words, I'd like for them to not need this tight of schedule, but I want to have a schedule that's as loose as it can possibly be and still predict kids' success. Physical, physical arrangements. Let's start with sight lines. And these should be second nature to you if you've ever been a teacher, especially teaching with kids with challenging behaviors. But what we know is, Kids are less likely to have problems when they know you can see them. Now, sometimes people say to the kids, as long as you can see me. But kids have a way of putting themselves in a position where they can see you, but you can't see them. It's our responsibility to set the room up and move about the room in such a way that I can easily have eye contact with every kid. Now, I can't see every one of you every second, but one, I want to keep moving so that I'm seeing you frequently, and two, I want you to believe that I could see your eyeballs in less than one second if I wanted to. I call this the one second rule. You might be thinking, can I get away with it? And my response to you is, don't try it because I'm looking all the time. And if you do anything in less than a second, I'm going to be looking at you. Now, that inhibits. I move around the room. My head is on a swivel. I look at kids. I can't walk a straight line through a room because of my paranoia that's been built into me from being a teacher. I have to walk and swivel and move and turn and spin because, again, if kids can't predict when I'm going to look, but no, it could easily happen in less than a second, it keeps them from having problems. Now, when kids don't have problems, I get to say, hey, Jimmy, you know how we talked about you staying in your seat and getting stuff done? I'm really impressed by how hard you're working at that. You've really done a nice job. Now, those of us who know Jimmy might say, well, the reason he's staying seated and doing his work is because he wants to go over and punch someone, but you're always looking. Exactly. I've created a success for kids, and I'm giving the kids the credit. Sometimes I say that's the definition of being a teacher. You set traps for kids to be successful and then give them the credit. I go home at night and have a drink and say, that was all me. But when I'm at school, I give the credit of success back to the kids, even though I know it's me that's creating it. But if I can create success rates of four to one or better for kids, I increase the probability that they keep doing it. And that's what I want. So I move and I look. What about furniture arrangement? Simple thing to think about is I want to be able to move through the room easily. So I don't like it when furniture is stacked in an area that I can't get through. Sometimes I think, I don't know if kids do it purposefully or if it's some sort of an innate um, something they're born with, but they will push their desks together in a way that I can't walk through to get to the next place where kids are. So I will make sure the furniture is arranged in such a way that I can. 
Where should the teacher's desk be? Well, I always put my desk up at the front of the room. While I didn't sit at it a whole lot, when I did sit at it, I could easily move my head just a little and see the eyeballs of every kid in the room. It's not just that I see their eyeballs, I want their eyeballs to see me seeing their eyeballs. When a kid knows that I'm looking or look often, it's just like that one second rule again. Hey, is the teacher looking? Yep, he's always looking. That's what I want them to think. So put your desk in a place where you can easily see everyone and they can see you seeing them. What about the kids' desks? Well, first, I'm going to talk about some arrangements, but first I'd like to talk about assigned seating. I'm a big fan of assigned seating. Every time I work in a classroom, if I'm there for more than a day or two, I assign seats. The reason I assign seats is because it seems to me such a simple thing to do to have major control over what's going on in a classroom. If you said you can predict behavior by kids who sit next to certain kids or where they sit in the room, then if I control that, I control the predictability. So assigned seating, the big problem you get with assigned seating is kids arguing about the assignments. So first, my suggestion for assigned seating is make it appear that it was random, even though it's not. So the kids come in and I say, hey, look up at the board. I've got all the desks drawn up there and I've drawn written a name on every desk. And here comes the lie. This is completely random. I just want people sitting next to different people and getting to know different people. So I've randomly assigned you. Well, you and I know it was not random. I very carefully thought out where you should sit and where you should not sit. But I don't want you to know that. If the kid with behavior problems think I, thinks that I put them in that chair for a reason, they're gonna argue about it. So I don't let them know they're in that chair for a reason. Now, what if I find out that a kid is having a problem where they are and they need to be moved? Well, I can make that happen easily. The next day they come in and I say, hey, last night I thought, what the heck, let's mix it up. So I flipped a bunch of coins and randomly moved a couple of people just to be keeping it loose. Now, I've had kids go, that's weird. The only thing different is he moved over there. That's the kid I wanted moved. And I just, yep, I don't know. That was purely random. I don't just, the flip of the coin, that's what it was. Now, to make that work, I will also do that with kids that don't have any problems. So once in a while, here's this teacher's pet kid. I'll just say, hey, I flipped a bunch of coins, and it'll be that kid that moved. Now, the next time I have to move the kid with the problem and they start to argue about it, I go, hey, this isn't about you. I do this with everybody. And what I found is as long as they don't think it's about them, they really don't care. As long as this is something typical that we do and it's not me moving them, it generally works fine. Let's look at some room arrangements. Now in this room arrangement, you see a bunch of desks and these are rows. The yellow stars equal problem behaviors. We've got some predictable problem behaviors in this room. If I wanted to have proximity to all the kids, I wanted to move through the room so that I could at least touch every kid's desk on the way through, it's going to take me a lot of steps. And so what a lot of times people will do is they'll move all the kids with problems into the front row. I don't think that makes sense. I don't want those kids all together. The other thing people do is put all those kids with problems in the back corner. That doesn't make sense either. Those kids need more of us, not less. They need to be spread out, and they're pretty spread out now. And I like the way that I can get to them easily. But think about this. Those red dots equal steps. It takes a lot of steps to walk through a room with rows in a way that allows you to touch every desk. Now, the yellow lines are the lines that I can have to get to individual kids quickly. 
Now that one is way in the back, but I typically stand up there by my computer when I'm at the front. So if I needed to walk back there, it's a straight line. I don't want to have to wander or serpentine through to get to a kid. Rows give me a lot that I like. Independence. It gives me a spread of the room. What I don't like about rows is the amount of walking I need to get to everyone. And rows really inhibit working together. Not, not that it can't be done, but it's a little harder. Although sometimes staying apart is more important than working together, depending on the kids and the class. Here's another one. I hate this classroom with the long tables that are put together because I can't easily walk through the room. And that's a problem. If I want to get to the back of the room, it's a long walk and it's a serpentine. I want direct access. Here is a simple way to change that. So what I do is I move that so that I can now walk directly to the back of the room and I can also walk to those other tables easily. Same number of seats as there were in the last example. We just have it organized better for us. Now, I've actually got fewer steps needed to touch every desk. And I can still put kids in locations where I can get to them easily. I still have assigned seats. But this classroom works for me now. Now, if you're given a classroom that has nothing but long tables, it's a challenge to find a way to organize it to make it be an effective classroom. This is the one way I've found that tends to work. I, I still would prefer to have desks than tables, but you don't always get what you need. Groups of four. We have a couple of groups of four with lots of problems. Groups of four are probably the most common desk arrangement at every level of school, from my experience. I like desks of four. It allows you to have some groupings that you can change once in a while. So you can do group work, but it also allows you to organize where kids go. The thing I have struggles with, with this type of setup, is it's hard to get around to see everybody. It's tight. All I've done when I go groups of four is I kind of move them into a semi-circle. Now I have really much fewer steps than I've had in the past in order to walk around. However, I am not able to touch those desks on the back of the circle by doing the small circle. So what I do when I assign seats is I put kids on the back that probably don't need me as often. And once in a while, I take a lap around the outside. But what I also do is I don't just take laps around the inside, I teach from the inside. So I'll just go out and stand right in that middle part while I'm teaching and I can stand really close to any kids. In fact, sometimes if there's a group that seems to be a little bit out of it, not quite paying attention, I won't say a thing to that group. I just keep on teaching, but I just wander over and stand next to that group while I'm teaching. Hey, Terry, you do have one question that came through in the chat. Yes. Um, so with social distancing, what would you recommend for student desk arrangement? Um, I, I have not thought about that at all, and that is a fantastic question. I guess the only way to maximize distancing is to do rows or some other way of setting kids up around the outside. Bottom line is, if you put 25 to 30 kids in a typical classroom, the math doesn't work to have them all be six feet apart. So what you've got to think about is what's the maximum distance we can get. And again, it's just a math problem. Rows are going to give you that but rows give you their own set of other issues. So um, again, I haven't really thought a lot about this because I haven't had to, um, but I, I do think it's a basic math logic. How many kids are there? How many square feet are there? You've only got so many places you can put kids before you run out of six foot radius. So I, I think you have to look at if you can't get six foot radius, what's the biggest radius I can get? 
and Rose would give that to you. Um, thanks for asking that question because I hadn't thought of that prior. Um, last group arrangement, which happens to be my personal favorite. The reason I like this one is the reality is when I'm teaching, I don't think time to make a lap, time to move through the room and touch every desk. I do it haphazardly, randomly as things occur to me. The reality is I teach like this. I randomly wander and rant and my arms are flailing and I'm talking to kids and doing things. And the reason I like this arrangement is because it allows me to do that and still be right around everybody. Now here again, I would put the kids that need more in the front of that, those groupings and other kids in the back. And I can take a lap around the back if I need to, or I can just move between tables, which is typically what I do. Here's the one problem I've had with this is that while I'm teaching at my computer and there's something up on the board, those star kids that are on the front have their back to me. So when I teach in a grouping like this, what I have done is I have taught all the kids. Here's my signal. When you hear that, you turn your chair to face me. So I give the signal. We've practiced that. We've talked about it. We've done it. And I will give the signal and I will wait. And if I don't get everybody turned around in three seconds, I'll give the signal again. But that was what I found I had to do because I was finding that when I was ranting and running around, they were looking at me somewhat. But when I went back up to the front, they just kept their back to me. And if I can't see their eyes and they can't know that I'm seeing their eyes, probability for problems goes up. Plus, I need them to be looking and engaged with the instruction. So I need eyes in order to do that. So let's move to one last thing I want to talk to in this area. And that is proximity. And we've talked about proximity all through this last part, but we've talked about it as proactive proximity. How do we use proximity and movement and a seating to prevent problems? But sometimes there are problems. What do you do when you see a problem? Remember, our best proximity, our easiest proximity is eye contact. So when you see kids off task or misbehaving, stop, look right at them, and use your mom look. You all know what I'm talking about. My mom could still probably give me a look that would make me gulp and stop whatever I'm doing and think about what to do different. So you see kids, stop, give them direct eye contact. If they get back to work, give them a thumbs up and keep moving, keep doing what you're doing. If they don't get back on task or doing what you want them to do, what you want to do then is walk to them. Don't run to them. Don't freak out and knock furniture over on your way there, just casually move directly to them. Say positive things to other kids on the way. That's a great prompt. This group's off task, and as you're walking to them, you're looking at other groups and saying, I am so impressed. This is some of the best work I've seen. That might be enough to get them back on before you get there, and then when you get there, you can say, good choices. Keep working, and then you always say this. Keep going, I'll be right back. And the reason you say I'll be right back is because you want them to know you're coming back. You don't wanna just stand there and stare at them because that's a challenge and for kids with behavior disorders, it's provocation. They'll think that you are disrespecting them by just standing there and staring at them and they're gonna say something's rude and stupid. So I just make sure I give a clear, here's what you're supposed to be doing. Show me that. Good for you. I'll be right back. I might be gone five seconds, but I'm leaving before I come back. If I go five seconds away and come back and they're working, I go, wow, still working. I'm impressed. Keep that going. And I try to go away for 10 or 15 next time. If I get all the way over there and they still aren't on task, then I'm going to, I call this the hover, I'm going to stay right at their desk and I'm going to give them the eye contact again. I want them to look at me before I say something. Because if they stop and look at me and then I say something, I don't have to raise my voice. If I get that eye contact and say, 
okay, we were all supposed to be working on number one. Who here can tell me what number one looks like? So I start with getting them going back in the lesson. And notice that when I do interact with them, I start with a question. A question gives you the best chance of getting things going without having them give you lip back, the back talk. So if I walk over there and go, how come you guys aren't working? That's not the kind of question I want to ask. How come everybody's working but you? That's not the kind of question I want to ask. It needs to sound genuine. Hey, sometimes I talk fast and I'm not sure everybody understands. You guys, did you guys hear what the direction was? Get people say, yeah, that's it. So why don't all of you show me you weren't working on that? Are you working on it? Good. Keep doing that. I'll be right back. But I'm going to go over there and I'm going to say something that is not likely to escalate them. So start with eye contact, then move over there and give lots of prompts that might set them up so you can say something positive. Once you get there, if they're not doing it, eye contact again. If they give you eye contact, ask a question. If they don't give you eye contact, you're going to have to ask the question, and it may involve you raising your voice enough so that you get their attention. But yelling is only going to make it worse. So those are all just logical strategies. Like we said when we started. Terry, I'm going to stop you right there. We have another question. So yes. this was actually asked earlier when you were talking about proactive proximity, but I think it could fit here as well. So how do we implement the effects of proximity in an e-learning environment? Well, you probably don't, unless you can see the kids. If you can see them, then you can always be telling them, I'm looking at you, I'm scanning across the pictures. If you can't see them, then all you've got is engagement. You've got to find ways for kids to do something so that you can see a hand raised or you can see that they submitted something. You can see that they did something. And then you can say, I see this, I see this, I see this. So when you can't see them, you're using engagement as your only way of having that proximity. If you can see them, then proximity simply becomes you letting them know you've got your eyes on them. But make no mistake, it is far more difficult to do in a virtual environment. It's more difficult to engage kids. It's more difficult to supervise kids. It's more difficult to find ways to use a, a proximity, even if you can see them. So I think both of the questions that we've had regarding um, kind of issues surrounding COVID are great questions. And I wish that I had oh, well, here's the simple answer, and that'll be simple. There isn't one. Um, I've been doing some um, virtual instruction. Well, I'm doing it now, but I've been doing working on some of that with teachers in public school classrooms, and it is incredibly challenging. And what I have found is the only thing that seems to make it feel like something's actually going on is that my OTRs go through the roof. It's like I'm doing five OTRs a minute, and it's the only way for me to feel like kids are actually doing something more than sitting and staring. But they might still be sitting and staring and doing my little prompts. I really don't know a lot of the time. So I think when we go to talking about virtual instruction, that there's a whole set of challenges that that brings for us. And there are several um, websites I know dedicated to strategies for using virtual instruction in a more engaging way, but all of them basically come back to using OTRs, even though they've got some fancy technological ways to do that. It's still OTRs. So thanks again. Great, great questions. I wish that I had. All right. I open the door. So we have another one that okay. piggybacks on that. Um, what happens if parents are so involved that the student is not being engaged? Um, one, I think when we begin instruction that we need to have a set of expectations for the adults also. So this is new for the adults too. So if we think we're teaching to a kid and the adult is sitting there, well, if the adult was in your classroom sitting next to the kids, you'd want to say to them, let me do this part, you do. 
So I think that it's good if you can have, if not a face to, you won't have a face to face, but if not a virtual conversation with adults, at least an email to them to say, here's what we're doing. During a lesson, if you feel like in, an adult is doing something, I think you can call out to a student and say, student, could you respond to this, please? I'd like to see or hear your response. Um, that doesn't guarantee you that parents aren't gonna keep doing it for them, but there is no such thing as uh, a, a way to make sure that's gonna work perfectly because it's um, beyond our control when we don't have them next to us. And if you just think how much of what I said of classroom management was eye contact and proximity, two things that are difficult, if not impossible to have when we're doing it virtually. So I, I guess what I'm saying is one, I don't know. Two, here are some things that I would say are good strategies, but three, I think you're gonna to have to look for other strategies and I think you're gonna to have to do some trial and error on things on your own as we move in this direction because it's very likely we will continue moving in that direction. Again, thank you for the questions. I'm gonna move past, um, actually that questioning strategies. I just, this should have been in a different place and I apologize, this is in the wrong place. Engaging kids simply by asking questions is not as engaging as you think. The effect size is only 0.46. What we'd rather have than, hey, answer question is, what do you think? And could you draw one of those? So if we're virtual, could you submit one of those? Could you demonstrate that on your end? Could you push the right button to show that, have them doing something rather than just answering a content question? what's the square root of 712 is not a very engaging question as opposed to other ways we could have that be demonstrated. So this is my last slide. Your betting guide. If you were gonna take the bet that I told you you had to take when we started out. Positive behavior means you win your bet, then you should predict when behaviors will go wrong and go to prevention. That's the proactive part. I've given you lots of little strategies, but teachers also invent their own little tricks and traps. And all tricks and traps are, are things we do to make it more likely that a kid will do it right so we can give them the credit for it. They might sound like negative things, they're not. They're reminders. They're me happening to mention that while talking about a TV show I watched last night, the thing I mentioned had nothing to do with the TV show, but I snuck it in there to remind you. Those reminders and prompts can also be more overt. Listen up, everybody, this is important. What are we gonna have to do when we get to the next part? What is it? So even with your reminders and prompts, you can do it with they answer, an engaging way. Encourage success. I know you can do this. I know you're gonna be able to get this done. I know you're gonna be with me because I'll be looking at you. Let kids know when they've done it right. Remember, verbals is where we want to be. And when kids do it wrong, recommit to correction. That's what we do academically. Think about that for behavior too. What would be a better way? Could you show me that? Is also a way of letting them know it's wrong, but it's a way that minimizes the negative and sets them up for reteaching and practice. Because if I say, what would be a better way? Could you show me that? Then I can go, that's right. That's a great way. Great. Thanks. Keep doing it that way. They still were told the other way was wrong, but now I've set them up to do it right. So I want to say a last thing, and that is a lot of times when I do this training, it's a lot longer and I've got a ton of videos that I chose not to do when doing it this way. Uh, one, for just because the time is shorter. But if you go to that website, cibrs.com, we have a whole bunch of videos already up and we are in the process of building more as we speak and there are eventually going to be hundreds of videos, including videos that show how to do many of the things I talked about today. Those are all public access free. 
And um, I urge you to go there and look and access those videos and share them with others. So, Marcy, that's the end of my presentation. Are there any other questions? We don't have any other questions at this time. We are at 2.30, so for those of you who um, need to go, please just remember to fill out our evaluation at www.indianaieprc.org slash eval. I'll have Mark add that to the chat. And also remember certificates of attendance will be sent within two weeks of the training, um, so those will be available for you as well. Um, I will stay on and I'll go ahead and ask Terry if he'll stay on for a couple minutes. If we have any other questions come in, then he can address those. But for those of you who um, have to go, you have a great afternoon and hopefully we'll see you at next week's summer virtual session. Thank you.